Well, welcome, everyone, for the first session, as you said, ever on Internet Governance, uh, uh, the Cyber uh, Cycon. Um, I remember some 10 years ago when I started working in the field of Internet Governance, uh, and I was basically behind the computer and delivering all these training programs that people does and so on about Internet Governance. And my, my parents and my friends were always like, well, what do you do for a living? I mean, you travel around the world, you do something on a computer, dealing with Internet Governance, whatever that is. And at some point, they kept calling me to fix their printers. Like, you're doing these things with internet things and so on. Uh, these days, they more and more call me to ask, like, eh, listen, I have this problem with Facebook privacy things and so on. OK, now we are there. So it takes some time to explain what internet governance is. Um, and that's what we are going to try to do today and, um, well, hopefully raise the temperature and open up uh, many of the questions. Now, try to give a zoom out from cybersecurity, which is probably one very important part within a broad political discussion on internet governance. Um, as we started discussing and planning the panel, we figured out that there is going to be a lot of acronyms probably around. And I want to test you to sound the temperature of the room. Would that be the, the, the right term? Uh, how many of you have heard about ICON? OK, that's, that's quite a good. You don't have much of a job today. <laughs> but how many of you have actually participated in ICON? ICON meetings. No, that's a different thing. OK, then the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum. How many of you have heard about IGF? Half of the room and participated. Two, three. And then the World Summit on Information Society, WSIS, you've heard about it, more or less, but participated in one of them. Again, the same people, OK. I won't ask about ITU. I guess the International Telecommunication Union is more or less familiar to all of you. Now, uh, before I, I leave the floor to, to our distinguished uh, guests, I want to draw your attention on, on this kind of a mapping of internet governance. We try to visualize it in, in a context of a building under construction, because it is a building under construction. You can see there are a couple of layers, a couple of levels of this building. The first one, bottom one, being infrastructure. And sometimes we don't, dis we discuss a lot of things, but we don't discuss the things related to critical resources of the internet, which is domain names and IP addresses. And that's what we are going to touch upon today with the help of David. Then on the bottom of this very solid uh, infrastructure part, and you can notice maybe this hippie guy, let's just remember the, the time and the context in which internet was built, it was built in time of 60s, 70s, hippie movement, peace brother stuff, and a lot of trust. No one ever envisaged the internet is going to be what it is today. So afterwards, after this very solid level, which is infrastructure, we see very shaky levels of legal aspects, cybersecurity as well, development, economic aspects, social, cultural, human rights. All of them are very shaky. That's what internet governance is about. But there is one more important thing that we are going to touch upon with, uh, with uh, our two other speakers. And you see this, who is building this building under construction? You can hardly even read that many names or acronyms around who is involved. And if you take a look at the bottom now, we have quite a crowd in 2015 of more and more parties getting in, or at least willing to get in, like the Global Conference on Cyberspace, like the Net Mundial Initiative, many, many others. So that's a very crowded space. And the question remains, we've been talking about multi-stakeholderism. What is the model that can help us uh, to, to have internet governance that works? It's not fragmented, not the governments of the internet, that the model that works, the multi-stakeholder that model that works. Or should it be actually the governments who traditionally have the role of the governance to keep the control over the internet? I'll keep it at that. And I'll start with David. Um, a bit of introduction of ICANN, even though I, I see that people know that. But then there is a lot, lot of things happening within the ICANN, and ICANN is probably one of the models of multi-stakeholderism, if we can say. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I'm David Conrad, ICANN CTO. Let's see, there we go. Uh, um, I'm uh, not used to speaking to this sort of audience. I tend to hang out with the IETF geeks 
Um, so you'll forgive me if I uh, get a little technical. If anyone has any questions or if I uh, am using too many acronyms, Vlad has indicated that he'll whack me upside the head. So, um, so first, before I get into my, the, the uh, uh, meat of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about trust. You know, this is the definition that you find in the dictionary about trust, the firm belief in reliability, truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. And the key words there are belief in someone or something. Um, you know, and the internet pretty much at all levels depends on trust. Uh, the uh, routing system that allows for packets to go from one point to another depends on something that has been loosely termed routing by rumor. ISPs uh, are uh, asserting that uh, the, the prefixes that are available to uh, their customers um, are routable through them, uh, and it is something that other ISPs intrinsically trust. The domain name system itself is a set of conventions that the community, uh, the people who use the internet, basically rely upon uh, to be generated by, currently, by ICANN as the IANA function operator. Um, but that is only a convention. It is something that is uh, convenient. Uh, it allows for a unified namespace across the entire internet. Um, however, as uh, Ronald Reagan uh, once said to Mikhail Gor Gorbachev, um, you, you can trust, but you need to verify. Uh, but in order to verify, you actually need to know who or what you're actually trying to trust. So ICANN's roles, and this is current as of today. It is changing, as many of you may know. Um, we operate, uh, we, we have sort of basically three uh, roles. We have operations, we perform the IANA functions under contract to the U.S. government, uh, and we perform a coordinative role of the global multi-stakeholder community. Um, in terms of operations, we run the L root server, one of 13 uh, root servers operated by 12 different organizations. Uh, currently receives about 25,000 queries per second. Um, it's distributed uh, currently, I believe, 150 individual machines spread out over 46 countries, I believe. It changes pretty regularly. Um, we operate the .int registry as part of the IANA functions contract. Uh, .int may be familiar to you all uh, as uh, the home of NATO, NATO.int. The .int registry was actually originally created to support NATO. Uh, we manage something called the DNSSEC Trust Anchor. Uh, DNSSEC is a technology that has been sort of backfitted onto the DNS to allow uh, end users, or actually uh, their agents, to verify information uh, that they receive over the network has not been modified in flight. Uh, if DNSSEC is not available, then uh, the bad guys can fairly easily spoof a uh, response and give you any data uh, that they would like to redirect you to pretty much anywhere they would like you to go. Uh, the IANA functions, uh, there are currently three major functions. Um, we propose changes to top-level domains, TLDs are top-level domains. They're the .com and .us, uh, .ee. Um, we are in the process of de uh, deploying um, about 500 new top-level domains through a, something called the new GTLD program, G for generic top-level domains. Um, we allocate large blocks of numbers to the regional internet registries. There are five of these registries across uh, the globe. Uh, the one for serving Europe is RIPE uh, Network Coordination Center based in Amsterdam. Um, and we also manage about 1,500 different protocol parameter registries for the IETF. Protocol parameters are unique values that are assigned in the standardization process. Um, we do this on behalf of the IETF under an agreement with them. Uh, in terms of uh, coordination, um, we implement policies that the global multi-stakeholder community uh, develops through the ICANN policy development process. Um, but those uh, policies are only applicable to the, the non-country code top-level domains. Uh, country code top-level domains are treated by ICANN as essentially national sovereign. Uh, if a uh, 
country code top level domain asks us to do something, as long as it technically makes sense, we will, we will go ahead and, and do it. If it doesn't uh, make sense, then we try to go back to them and say, are you really sure you want to remove yourself from the root zone of the internet? Uh, usually they uh, say, no, no, we didn't mean that, uh, although there have been on occasions where we were asked to implement something that we knew was technically wrong, and not surprisingly, it broke things. Um, we accredit DNS registrars. Uh, one of the uh, innovations that uh, ICANN was created to implement was a separation of uh, the registry, where the data is actually held, from the bodies that actually sell the domain names. So you could think of it sort of a wholesale and retail split. Um, uh, in order for those retailers to do, provide services, um, they have to be accredited by ICANN. There is a long, drawn-out process with a you know, multi-hundred page document that you end up having to fill out if you'd like to go that route. Um, we recognize regional internet registries. These are the uh, address allocation bodies, uh, IP addresses, and another set of numbers called autonomous system numbers. Um, there are currently five of these. They're sort of continental in scope. They are regional monopolies. So if you are based in Europe, if your ISP, rather, is based in Europe, you will get service from RIPE-NCC, whereas if you are based, your ISP is based in Africa, you will get uh, uh, services from Afrinic. Um, uh, and uh, we also ratify global addressing policies. So the <laughs> multi-stakeholder communities within the numbering communities develop these addressing policies, how, I, how the regional internet registries will be allocating addresses to uh, uh, their, their members, which are generally internet service providers. Um, uh, and uh, in very rare circumstances, these policies are applicable across the planet in which case they're forwarded up to ICANN for ratification. So what does ICANN do in the context of cybersecurity? Well, uh, to be honest, not a whole lot. Uh, ICANN is mostly non-operational. The only tools we really have are the ability to enforce contracts that uh, the registries and registrars uh, enter into. And the registries that I'm talking about here are only the generic top-level domain registries. Folks like .com, .org, uh, .berlin. Um, there are, uh, like I said, about 500 of these. Um, the community defines the policies that ICANN enforces. Um, these policies are implemented by IANA via the IANA functions contract. Uh, the way that generally works is we receive a request from a top-level domain administrator, you know, the folks who run, uh, for example, .ee. Um, we do some technical vetting to make sure the, the request makes sense, and if it does, we forward it currently onto NTIA for authorization. NTIA ensures that we, ICANN, have followed our processes. That is the only thing we do, only thing they do, sorry. Um, they do not actually care about the content itself, um, and to be honest, they don't have the technical knowledge uh, within the NTI office to actually vet uh, any of these requests on a technical basis, but they do verify that ICANN has followed its own processes, and when that is done, the change is then forwarded on to uh, the root zone maintainer, uh, which is currently VeriSign, a US-based company, um, VeriSign then makes the change to the root zone, uh, pushes out a, a, a changed root zone, signs it using um, the, uh, a key that's based off the, the root trust anchor that ICANN maintains, and then pushes that change out to the 13 root servers. Those root servers, as I mentioned, ICANN runs one of them. Uh, the L root server operated by uh, uh, ICANN is located in 115 countries. Um, that's 46 countries, uh, but there are uh, three root servers that are actually operated by non-U.S. companies, one operated by uh, uh, RIPE NCC in Europe, another uh, operated by an organization in uh, Sweden, and the, the third operated by a research institute in um, uh, Japan. Um, so as a result of this, um, we actually have a very limited role uh, in terms of cybersecurity. Um, what we have been doing within ICANN 
encouraged by the law enforcement side of the multi-stakeholder community is to try to facilitate attribution, to try to make it easier to determine who is uh, to be trusted. Yep, and this is a very last slide. It is an eye chart only intended to show the insane complexity associated with the transition. Um, the uh, amount of email, 18,559 email messages, um, 270 individual meetings that have occurred since the announcement on March 14th. This uh, exercise has been um, quite elaborate uh, and probably beyond the imagining of the folks who initiated the uh, transition. However, the multi-stakeholder community is definitely engaged in this. Uh, and hopefully it is a way that some trust can be restored uh, if any trust was lost um, in the events of the past couple of years regarding how internet governance is actually done. And with that, I'm over time, so my apologies. Um, I think the only acronym that you maybe missed to say is the NTIA, Oops, sorry. Yes. which is basically a part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, or uh, within the United States, those from the United States know. Uh, is there any direct clarification needed? We'll get back to questions and comments afterwards. Is there any direct clarification needed from David by any one of you now? Or should we move on? I'll take it as we can move on, or they're too confused, but we'll yes. get back to that as well. Okay, we're moving to the second part, which goes a little bit away, or still stays within the uh, bottom level of this of this building, but rather moves into the partnership or who is in charge and who should be how can this model work? What's the relation between the governments and maybe other stakeholders? And should there be an international treaty? What should it be and so on? And I leave it to Richard, your ten minutes, Richard. How many of you are involved directly in the defense uh, of your country, either directly in the military or in a company that's working directly with the military? Almost everybody, that's what I thought. Uh, now, how many of you could actually ensure your mission if the civilian infrastructure got completely wiped out through a cyber attack? Don't raise your hands, I'm sure that's classified information. Uh, but I would posit that the only country that, whose military could function more than one or two days in the absence of electrical power trucks, trains, and such things as the U.S. military, and even they probably couldn't function more than a couple of months, I would guess. So again, you're not going to tell me the exact answer. But what we heard this morning from all the speakers, I took notes, was very consistent. The civilian infra infrastructure is more and more dependent on the Internet. We know that. The Internet is more and more subject to cyber attacks. And cyber attacks are no longer coming merely from state actors. They're also coming from civilian actors, cyber criminals, mafias, even we heard some private companies that are defending themselves through offensive attacks. So I would posit that we have a problem. And why do we have a problem? In my opinion, by the way, they brought me in as a provocateur, you already know that. Uh, why do we have a problem? We have a problem because the so-called good guys, us in the West, actually started this. Stuxnet is the first well-known example. There were probably other ones. Uh, it's rumored that in the first Iraqi war, there was also some kind of cyber attack uh, on the side of the U.S. in cooperation with the French who'd made the radar systems for the Iraqis uh, at that time. And I think we're sending the wrong message. People can reverse engineer Stuxnet, and they probably have. And once you see what you can do with such attacks, then you get ideas. So what's to prevent cyber criminals from bringing down a financial system? And then your soldiers don't get paid anymore. Well, how's that going to work? And what if they bring down the electrical power grid, which is soon going to be possible because of the Internet of Things and everything is interconnected, etc. So, uh, and I'm not the only one saying this, by the way. Civil society activists basically think we're on a dangerous race to the bottom. And so we need to limit uh, cyber attacks and cyber activities. And we have a long tradition of limiting certain types of military activities. There is a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. That's not a good example. Personally, I, I think uh, mutual assured destruction works fairly well. Uh, but on the other hand, we limit chemical weapons. 
Now, some people will say, well, yeah, but that's because they weren't very effective as military weapons, so it was fairly easy to limit them. True, but still, we did limit them. Uh, and as you all know, there are some limits on certain types of uh, munitions. You can't shoot certain types of bullets at people. We've all agreed not to do that. And there are also some countries that have signed up to limit the use of certain kinds of mines and other anti-personnel weapons. So it is possible to negotiate agreements to limit things. Uh, and there are areas of the world which are demilitarized, like Antarctica and outer space. So one could think of uh, demilitarizing the Internet or at least limiting certain types of activity. Now, how is that done? Well, that's done, as we heard, by cooperation. We heard everybody this morning said we need cooperation. Well, how do you cooperate in this area? Well, either you do a treaty, but that's very difficult, as we know. It's very difficult to get 192 countries uh, to agree to a treaty, or 93. I forget how many there are exactly in the UN now, a little bit more than that. It's 193 in the ITU. Uh, but you can have agreements in zones, so certainly it would be easier to get agreement within NATO, for example. You can have bilaterals, and you can have non-binding uh, resolutions. You can have uh, things which are uh, less complicated than treaties because they don't have to go to national parliaments. Now, I'm going to be very controversial and say that, uh, as uh, Colonel Sozik said, uh, we need to revisit things because otherwise it might collapse. Well, actually, I think it has collapsed. We are in a state of cyber war, not in the classical definition of cyber war, of course. The classical definition of cyber war, and I've had long discussion with Anne Marie about that, is attacks that reach the level of physical violence of conventional war. But war is also used figuratively, right? We have the war on drugs. We have economic warfare, uh, we have the war on terror, and there's just a book out, which I like to quote by Powers and Jablonski, The Real Cyber War, the internet or cyberspace being used to achieve geopolitical and geoeconomic goals. Many countries, in fact, I would probably posit all countries, are making war on their own citizens through mass surveillance. Because that's what you're doing, right? You're saying, we don't trust anybody here. So we're going to collect all this data, and we're going to analyze it just in case there are a couple terrorists floating around. Terrorism, as we know it in the West, is basically violent criminal activity. Well, there's lots of other violent criminal activity. Does anybody think here that mass surveillance would be an effective means to stop bank robberies? No, why not? Because there are not that many bank robbers out there. So there's no point in surveilling everybody to pick out this 0, 0.01 percent. But guess what? In most countries, there are a lot more bank robbers than there are terrorists. So why does anybody think that this is a useful thing to do? And by the way, I don't criticize the NSA. The NSA is only doing what its master told it to do. Its master, in this case, being the U.S. Congress and then the U.S. President. NSA is simply doing what the political system told it to do. The problem is at the political system. So I realize you don't necessarily want to go back and lobby the political system, but to the extent that you go back home and you vote, or you talk to voters, I think you should keep this in mind. We're giving a very bad message. We're saying the state cannot trust its own citizen. Worse, some states, and it's just, not just the U.S. The U.S. has been the most open about it. They're surveilling their non-citizens. So I'm not a U.S. citizen anymore, and so I'm surveilled by the U.S., and it's legal. Admiral Rogers was perfectly right. The U.S. takes the view that if you're not a U.S. citizen and you're not physically in the U.S., they can surveil you, and they don't need a court order. That's the law in the U.S. I think that's a strange law. I think we have to change that. Uh, <clears throat> and the other type uh, of cyber attacks we're getting is the one that we know about. Uh, we've mentioned you know, specific things from cyber criminals, et cetera, coming from a lack of security. So what we need to do is improve cooperation. And as I mentioned, one of the ways to do that is a treaty. And now I'll focus, and I'll be right on time. Uh, the formal version of this speech, by the way, is in the uh, very nice book you got. I commend it highly because it has my article in it, of course. Uh, that you, is in your folder, uh, and my speech is uh, in around page, starts on page 119, and on page 124 you have uh, the provisions of this treaty that uh, came up in Dubai in 2012, and you can see that this was a rather important event because a very senior figure like Admiral Rogers actually knew about it. You notice when I mentioned Dubai, he knew exactly what I was talking about. So uh, I won't read the well, I will read it because I have time. Basically, there was an article that said that member states shall individually and collectively endeavor to ensure the security and robustness of international telecommunication networks in order to achieve effective use thereof and avoid the technical harm thereto, as well as the harmonious development of international telecommunication services offered to the public. 
Okay, that's bureaucraties in plain language it says states should cooperate to improve cybersecurity. What's wrong with that? Okay, does anybody here other than a couple colleagues and Anna Maria know what the objection was to that? Why did the United States and all the European countries refuse to adopt that treaty provision? Okay, Admiral Rogers knows. It's because, the argument was, it can threaten free speech, which is true. If you impose security, you can also say, well, look, we're, security includes terrorists, right? Uh, well, by the way, terrorists happen to be, for example, Falun Gong or whatever, you know, take your favorite dissident group. Well, actually, we got around that because, it, and this is explained in uh, other articles that I cited in my article here, we put in the preamble that nothing in the treaty can be understood as restricting human rights. So actually, this provision cannot be invoked to impose censorship. Now, the guys who want to impose censorship do it anyway. So to say that we're not going to sign this because we don't want censorship doesn't actually make sense. So actually, what the discussion was about is exactly what Admiral Rogers said in response to my first question. It's this conflict between uh, state control, national sovereignty, non-state control. Uh, and that's where I come back uh, to my main point. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that the United States, with some help from uh, several of the European countries, uh, is doing exactly what, uh, what Admiral Rogers said. They don't want national control by other governments. They don't have a problem with national control of their own. And they don't have any problem with extraterritorial application of their own laws. There's nothing new about that. The U.S. routinely applies its own law extraterritorially. And mass surveillance is an example of that. So I will just conclude by saying that I think that we in the West, and the U.S. in particular, are setting the wrong example. We're giving the wrong ideas, and it's unsustainable because the guys that we consider to be the bad guys, they're going to be better at this than we are now. Does anybody seriously think that the Chinese, to take, take anybody you like as your favorite enemy, I, I don't care which one, does anybody think that these guys will not be able to do more, better cyber war than we can do today? and we have a lot more to lose. So I would pause the time has come to get serious and to start to negotiate, hopefully, a treaty that might be ambitious, but at least steps along that way. And I'm happy to discuss that more offline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm not sure if I should now ask the audience if there is any need for clarification or we leave it for later. But if there is a need for clarification, Otherwise, we, we move on to, to discussions afterwards. Um, moving on to, or keeping in a way, uh, in, in discussion about surveillance as well, but touching upon the sovereignty or the idea of protecting the own spaces in cyberspace. So I leave it to Isabel. Uh, Isabel, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your contributions also. So we've touched already on the, on the issue of trust, which is fundamental for cooperation in internet governance, but also in all social spheres, right? And um, after the Snowden revelations, we've definitely seen an erosion of trust in the internet community, but also internationally, and even between citizens and government. Um, the future of internet governance now will really depend on, after such a focusing event, will really depend on which proposals are out there to address this erosion of trust um, that might actually help and, you know, have a positive effect in a way that we can create more cooperation, or others that might um, maybe uh, lead to more regionalized approaches. and. Um, I would like to talk exactly about um, proposals for uh, regionalized approaches in which governments are actually trying to retreat and other actors to retreat within their regional borders in order to address the challenge of um, surveillance as a counter reaction. And um, in a study we did together with um, so the Global Public Policy Institute and New America together did a study on technological sovereignty in Europe. Now, this is an umbrella term which has been used for many different proposals put forward to protect against surveillance of individuals and private companies and also governments with a hidden agenda sometimes to also protect um, economic interests. So there's not really a clear definition of this term, technological sovereignty. 
But um, we can see that the that they range, like the measures that have been proposed under this term range from um, technical measures such as data localization measures or having new undersea cables that might not bypass the US, that might not pass through the US um, towards you know, domestic protection of hardware and software, um, but also data protection legislation in Europe um, or international no spy agreements. In our analysis, we focused really on the technical proposals um, and we focused on those proposals because they have a direct impact on the Internet's architecture, which um, might last longer than, uh, than the political idea, basically. So we came to the conclusion that actually most of those proposals don't protect against surveillance, and they, have, they often have unintended side effects, depending on how they're implemented. Um, they might, in fact, even threaten um, the open and distributed ar architecture of the Internet, and uh, might also um, you know, endanger some of the economic benefits that the internet offers. As an example, I would like to talk a little bit about data localization. So data localization is a new phenomenon that governments have been advocating around the world to keep, um, to confine data flows and also store data um, of their own citizens mostly within their own geographical borders. Um, we've seen in Germany the proposals for so-called Schengen routing, localized routing, so that um, the data of people located in the Schengen zone and interacting in the Schengen zone over the internet should by no means cross the US or the UK because it could be surveilled. Um, but we've also seen that this is actually quite problematic because, first of all, the location of data often does not really uh, protect against surveillance only, it's also, about, um, it's also about the jurisdiction and how this data is exactly secured. Um, moreover, this would require that ISPs presumably would change their uh, routing tables, but if this is mandated by governments, this, um, this is really an, an intrusive act actually in uh, the internet architecture, which needs to be discussed with a lot more stakeholders than just uh, governments. So um, there have also been other proposals uh, in terms of localization for the localization of hard and software manufacturing within, uh, within Europe and to create a strong European industry um, that is protected from competitors outside of Europe, namely the US or uh, also Asia. And there has been an idea, for example, to produce an IT Airbus um, thinking of the famous example of having, you know, a strong competitor, French-German competitor to Boeing. But until now, we have not really seen how exactly um, you could produce uh, something sim similar um, only in, in one country or even in one region, um, since the supply chain is so globalized that until now, we haven't seen how this can be realized. Um, so, all the localization proposals that we looked at um, will actually not achieve the purported goal to protect against surveillance. The data can still be intercepted, even if it is stored in a given geographical territory. Um, so it is how it, about how it is secured. And here, we have really seen more encouraging proposals, um, especially proposals to encrypt data and uh, make that encryption more available, widely available and more usable. Um, to users around the world. Now, we've seen also uh, earlier um, during the day that this is a very much debated proposal and there are different interests at stake. Uh, national security authorities have the mandate and the legitimate interest to protect uh, our citizens from harmful attacks. But we can maybe discuss that later. Here, it's really about if the data needs to be secure, this is the only proposal that will really work from the proposals that we've examined. So um, there have also been a number of other proposals that relate, for example, to the strengthening of data protection in Europe. Um, and the data protection regulation right now is still being negotiated, as you might know. There are some controversial uh, articles in there, but this might really, this might be actually a positive development. Um, to, to achieve data protection in a less uh, 
you know, technical, less intrusive way. But we will have to wait. We've also seen that um, on the international level, Germany, for example, with Brazil, has um, pushed for uh, resolutions, a UN resolution, for the protection of the right to privacy internationally. And that has been quite successful because those um, two resolutions were adopted 2013 and 2014. So we can see that actually legal norms will um, emerge and, and that might be um, something we can, uh, we can deem more towards the positive cooperation side. Um, and those proposals adopt a very rights-based approach, contrary to reorienting towards local platforms and services, which until now has not really proven to be very effective. Probably in the future, we will see a little bit of both of those scenarios. We will see the continuation of fragmentation, which has always been there, also before uh, claims for technological sovereignty arise, arose. Um, and also uh, other areas of more cooperation, such as for the um, ICANN Ayana transition. But um, fortunately, we've seen that, at least in Europe, in the European debate, the political traction for proposals of data localization actually is very low now. So policymakers have recognized this will not really help us. There have been a lot of critical reporting in the media about these proposals. And so we not get a Schengen internet and also not get a Schengen cloud. But those proposals are still very much up to date in other countries that might use um, data localization measures for very different purposes and for the purposes to control their own citizens through these uh, technologies. And here I'm talking, for example, about a law that has been passed in Russia um, where, uh, under, which, um, under which content providers and uh, social media firms need to store um, all personal data of Russian citizens within Russia so they can actually be more easily <laughs> controlled and intercepted by um, domestic security authorities and services. So to sum up here, um, our research has shown that there will always be, uh, especially in internet governance, situations of exogenous shocks and um, focusing events which will produce distrust among the community and go beyond that internet community also. But, and then the, f the future of the internet, or however we want to call it, really depends on what are the reactions, what, what different proposals do we have out there and which ones will we choose to adopt to get out of the situation of distrust and to build more cooperation or actually to go back and regionalize a little bit. Um, and I think here we especially need to pay attention um, to proposals that, will, that might change the architecture of the internet because those effects will really be, um, if we're unlucky, will be, very, will be lasting uh, effects that will affect um, also the uh, experience and um, of the experience of actors online and also, the, um, and also the rights and choices they have online. So this is not only important for users in uh, today and that are located in the countries um, or transatlantic arena, but mostly also for the future building users, which will come from mostly also developing countries where the legal frameworks that govern their rights will not be as strong and um, or not be very democratic at least. And so um, I think we really, um, to conclude, when choosing to react how to um, secure the internet after such a focusing event, um, decisions, those taking the decisions need to take into account the lasting effects um, on the distributed internet architecture. Thank you, Isabel. Um, seems like it's even more complex than we started with. So, if you if you know this this um, gadget called I think they call it Newton's cradle, where you have a couple of um, metal balls. When you move one, then that one hits the other one, and then the whole balls set of balls start mo moving back and forth. Well, I think that's what we are talking about now. We, if we talk only about security, then we move this one ball out of uh, the the position, and then when we throw it, it strikes 
um, surveillance, data protection, online freedoms. So there are a lot of things that are very interrelated. Then the second thing that I noted is that we are all kind of aware of um, a lot of risks. And we're not talking only about attacks. Attacks is one set of risks. The other set of risk is fragmentation, not balkanization. Once again, mm -hmm. fragmentation. And I know that uh, there is a good project uh, mapping. I don't know, Alex is somewhere there. He has some flyers on the mapping project, so you can get him back in the back. There's a lot of discussions about fragmentation, the possible consequences of internet as well. Um, and then the, second, the third risk is the control of the citizens. Um, and finally, I see that the solutions uh, might have been the technical sovereignty, which seems like doesn't work, the treaties, which seems like doesn't take place. Um, there was something else. Um, ah, yeah, cooperation. On level of cybercrime, even it doesn't take so much. Well, it goes, but not that much as we might like to see. So it's not really that bright, huh? Now I throw it back to you for comments and questions on this first part, so that we sense what, what might be of your concerns. Um, I don't know where is the microphone. We have the, the microphone is there. Questions, comments to start with. Don't be shy, or should I throw it to them? We have one comment over there. Thank you. My name is uh, Lodewijk van Zwieten. I'm a prosecutor in the Netherlands uh, dealing with cybercrime cases. Um, well, concerning um, the last presentation, that, that got me thinking that, po that probably, from my perspective, law enforcement perspective, data localization will probably compound to the difficulties that we already have when it comes to, uh, to, um, to, to, to jurisdictional issues um, in cybercrime cases. And, um, I, for one, am quite happy to hear that it didn't get too much traction. Um, um, I, was, I was wondering if thoughts are already shifting then towards another paradigm whereby you don't focus or you don't establish your, your jurisdiction based on the location where the data is stored, but perhaps based on the location where the user are, or, or the owner of, uh, of, uh, of that data is, uh, is residing. Would that make more sense when it comes to establishing jurisdiction. Thank you. I will leave it to Isabel maybe first, and yeah. then first Isabel. Or you want to pass it on to them. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, you were saying as an alternative approach to data localization, we could, um, we could choose an approach and look at where the user is located, right? Yes, I think that's um, also one of the pr approaches right now in the uh, data protection regulation, which is a different field, obviously, from, from cybercrime. But um, I think a lot of issues have been conflated in the debate on data localization, namely that physical location has been conflated with jurisdiction and also with access to the data. So if we are thinking about um, a server um, that is hosting um, infra infrastructure as a service and data from other um, from from users, we could imagine that um, it will be difficult to determine really, you know, where is the user, where is the company located, and that in the end will um, get us to the problem of mutual legal assistance treaties which definitely need to be reformed. But I think the why a lot of countries are directly um, intercepting information also, uh, or at least law enforcement agencies, um, from, uh, with a warrant um, and not through mutual legal assistance treaties, even though they know where uh, someone is located in another country, um, is because the mutual legal assistance treaty uh, format is very cumbersome and there's not enough funding available for that. So, so in that sense, I think we need to start there. We need to start with a reform of, the, of those treaties between states, wherever it's possible. Obviously, it might not work between China and the US, but um, we have a case right now with uh, Ireland and, Mic and Microsoft in Ireland and the US. We'll see how that plays out. Um, and I think that's already a start for 
the location of the user, um, as far as I heard from people I've talked to who are operating clouds, they sometimes just don't know where the user is. Um, and they also don't know which, citizen the, uh, which citizenship the user has. So there's a lot of practical problems. And if they get, let's say, hundreds of requests per day, um, they don't have the resources, at least someone from Microsoft told me that they don't have the resources to actually address all of those uh, and find out where the user is exactly and which citizenship it has. David? Um, in, the <coughs> excuse me, in the context of the DNS, um, ICANN's uh, community has developed a, uh, a policy um, implementation that is um, going to try to centralize um, the registration data. So, uh, the, and this was primarily driven by uh, law enforcement interests within the multi-stakeholder community um, uh, with, uh, uh, shall we say, a little unhappiness from the registry and registrar communities. Uh, not so much registrars because uh, currently the registrars hold the data uh, for the vast majority of top-level domains, uh, and this is going to centralize into the registries. The registries, on the other hand, have not been particularly excited about this. Um, the, uh, whether this model actually uh, is helpful or not um, largely depends on um, how we are going to be able to implement. Um, as you might imagine, um, centralizing this data um, has some challenges uh, within the context of European data protection laws. Uh, and that's something that ICANN is currently struggling to figure out how to implement. You know, the community has told us just go and do it, and we're now struggling to figure out how exactly we're supposed to do it. Um, but it is something that is uh, currently underway. Um, and uh, I would, you know, if you have views or interests in this area, I would strongly encourage uh, participation, particularly within the context of the, uh, the law enforcement uh, subgroup of the Government uh, Advisory Committee uh, within ICANN. Thanks. Richard? Um, yes, from, <clears throat> from my point of view as a civil society activist, uh, we're very clear. Data belongs to the user. Uh, and should be controlled by the users. So I think that matches uh, uh, what we've heard both from uh, law enforcement and from Isabel. Now, the problem is that we know that many things are transnational on the internet. That's normal. It was uh, designed to do that. And by the way, it wasn't the first transnational system. Who knows what the first transnational telecommunication system was? Nobody wants to guess? Telegraph? Of course, telegraphy. And that led to the creation of the ITU in 1865. Why? Well, because there were some issues to be solved. The first one was uh, technical protocols to allow interconnectivity. The second one is precisely what we're discussing now. What level of protection should be agreed internationally on freedom of speech versus uh, monitoring? And the ITU constitution since 1865 has had a provision on secrecy of telecommunications, meaning privacy and restrictions on intercept. The language is so weak now that it doesn't have any practical effect, but it shows this idea was there. And the third thing that was in the ITU constitution of 1865 was the billing arrangements, which we're not going to talk about here, but I'm happy to talk about that if anybody wants to open that up. So th these are fundamental things that have always been around, but of course the stakes are much higher now, because with telegraphy you only had offices interconnected, not three billion and soon, we hope, six billion or even eight billion people. Uh, so we're missing it, from my point of view, a sufficient density of legal norms. How many people here are lawyers or know something about the law? Okay, not too many. So the idea of the density of the law is into how much detail you go. You know, the Constitution is very vague, and then you have laws, and you have regulations and interpretations of the courts. So right now, we have insufficient density of the legal system to cope with the these questions, and that's the problem. You know, if you go to the MLATs, it takes forever to get some kind of response. So it's nice to say, yeah, it's the jurisdiction of the owner of the data, but in practice, how's that going to work? But to me, that doesn't argue for a, a national system. It simply says, wait a minute, you know, we need to develop more uh, international norms. And yes, the UN system is slow, but that's okay. I think laws have to develop slowly in response to reality and not come out of the sky based on not understanding what's going on. So I think that if we let the regular system work uh, properly and use things like the Hague Conference uh, and the UNCTRAL Conference and even the ITU, uh, although it's not appropriate for cybercrime, 
then we could make progress. And the Budapest Convention, I think most of us would agree, is a very useful uh, step in that direction. Then I just want to say a word on, uh, on the uh, data localization. Uh, I agree with Isabel, data localization in practice will not protect you because uh, any number of organizations, including non-state actors, will be able to penetrate whatever level of security you have and get your data. But there is a difference. If my data is stored locally in Switzerland, then it's illegal for anybody, including the NSA, to come get it in Switzerland. Whereas if my data is stored in the US, it's perfectly legal for the NSA and any number of other people, depending on how they do it, uh, to get at the data. So there is a big difference. Now, some people say to me, yeah, you're always talking about laws, but laws don't work. Well, yeah, sure, they never work 100%. We have speed limits. We have prohibitions on selling alcohol to uh, young people. Here it seems to be 21, which is a rather high age. Do they work 100%? No. Are they better than not having the laws? Yes. So you should accept that certain principles we want to codify in laws, even if we know that they don't work 100%. So I would argue that data localization is not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on how you do it and the reasons you're doing it for. And of course, I agree with you. Some states want to do that because they want to control their citizens and not for noble aims. But we shouldn't conflate everything. David. So one of the, the, uh, the major challenges that I see with using uh, legal regimes to try to uh, enforce norms across the internet is uh, the, the uh, question of attribution. Um, yeah, the, one of the uh, benefits and challenges of the internet is that it uh, gives you know, the ability for anyone to be an actor um, uh, in ways that are uh, greatly magnified to what they would be able to do as an individual. Um, you know, uh, Admiral Rogers uh, made the an analogy with the, the law of the sea. And part of the challenge that I see with attempting to apply um, you know, legal regimes into the context of the internet is uh, similar to uh, having a law of the sea where any anonymous 13-year-old can uh, deploy a Trident-class submarine, fully loaded. Um, uh, the result of this um, is that uh, legal analyses and legal mechanisms by which um, actors are attempted to be constrained will always be at a disadvantage because you can't figure out who the actual actor is with 100% certainty by which you can apply legal remedies. So um, while I am uh, in favor of uh, developing norms and mechanisms by which um, the uh, internet can be made uh, more safe or more um, uh, secure, the challenge is how exactly can you implement that in an environment where you have no idea who it is is attacking you. Um, or if you do have an idea, there is always a doubt whether it is that entity attacking you or that entity is a mere proxy for someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to respond to the um, to your comment on data localization. And um, sure, I think that there are laws which obviously don't allow um, don't allow communications of national citizens to be intercepted. But um, first of all, we need to ask, when it comes to data localization, we need to ask, in my opinion, who, does, who imp implements these measures? Is it the ISP, just voluntarily, you know, peering, for example, with other ISPs, so that the, uh, it peers with a lot of national ISPs, and so the internet traffic naturally will flow um, nationally? Or will it be the government that is mandating ISPs to change their routing tables and then force them, more or less, to, uh, to have the traffic localized? So I think there's one big difference here and um, that we need to acknowledge also. And um, that's also maybe a difference if we are talking about the Chinese internet or the Iranian or the Russian internet from the internet in Germany, let's say. But then there's a second, um, a second point I want to make, and uh, it's actually a very current topic, because right now in Germany, which, um, where I am from, and, and where the debate uh, of the NSA revelations has always been 
very big, um, very negative towards the NSA, and many people were disappointed by what has been ongoing. We have now found that actually, um, that actually our own intelligence service um, will collect data from our main internet exchange point in Germany, which is routing now, I think, more than 90% of inner German traffic. And I think for me, that is really the proof for why localization does not help against surveillance because we have a bigger problem here, which is that our own intelligence service is legally yeah, under, well, at least that's what it said, it's not yet clear, but perfectly legally um, intercepting that data. And so in that sense, data localization can make access to uh, data that is routed or stored within the country even easier. And so that's one of the concerns I have when, uh, when I think about these proposals. That one can, one can probably say, this is your problem now. Yeah. I mean, it's just, if it is a global problem, that's all of us. If it is in Germany, that's your problem. Take, take it. So it <laughs> might be you. better that way. <laughs> well, we're working on it. Depends <laughs> how, how you do it. Okay, uh, questions over there. Um, in the back. Just introduce yourself, please. Uh, Rob Morgus from New America. I actually helped Isabel write the paper that she has presented on. But uh, I also see a couple of problems with your argument, Mr. Hill. Uh, First of all, espionage is illegal in every country. The NSA is not bound by Swiss law. It's bound by American law. And 12333 is arguably more accepting of data collection than 202. And there's an argument to be made that the data stored in the US is actually less accessible to the NSA legally than the data stored abroad. Uh, but frankly, none of that really matters because it comes down to the technical capability of the NSA and their ability to collect this data, in my opinion. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the domestic legal authorities in the US that dictate what data the US can access and how that relates to your argument that data localization can potentially uh, increase the security from surveillance. Thanks. Um, yeah, actually, I'm not, the, the, I'm not the only one who thinks that. There are a large number of private companies, as I'm sure you know, uh, that have moved their uh, servers out of the U.S. into other jurisdictions, in particular Switzerland, uh, because what you said is correct, but what I said is also correct. It's legal for the U.S. to obtain data by hacking into a Swiss server, but that violates Swiss criminal law. So if the person or entity uh, that does that gets caught, and if the Swiss decide to prosecute, which is a different matter, uh, then something's going to happen. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, the um, parliament instructed the government, no, it was the government instructed the prosecutor to look into whether the NSA activities were violating Swiss law. Technically, the investigation is still open. Personally, as a Swiss citizen, I'm convinced that it's going to go nowhere because Switzerland will never dare to challenge the US on that. But again, speaking as an activist, I think that's wrong. I think that all democratic governments should challenge the US because in my view, and it's not just my view, it's a very widely held view, the US interpretation of, who knows what is the ICCPPR here? The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is the treaty that implements the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and it includes the right to privacy. But at the preamble, it basically says that states agreed to enforce these rights within their own territory. And so the US, this is not an interpretation, this is a formal statement from the US sent to the Human Rights Committee, the U.S. takes the view that its obligations are confined to U.S. persons. A U.S. person is somebody who is physically in the U.S. or who is a U.S. citizen. And they interpret the ICCPPR as not imposing any obligations under international <laughs> law to non-U.S. persons. Now, most everybody else thinks this is a totally absurd interpretation of a fundamental human right treaty. And so my uh, concern is that the U.S. is actually violating international human rights law Worse, you're giving the wrong idea, because now suppose everybody applies this. Well, let's take Switzerland, and the Swiss can say, okay, so the U.S. believes that it can do anything it wants uh, to Swiss people, because they're not protected by the ICCPPR. But wait a minute, I'm Switzerland. I have both positive and negative obligations under international human rights law, and I have the <clears throat> positive obligation to protect my citizens from the illegal spying of the U.S. 
And so Switzerland, logically, should start to take steps to protect me against this spying from the US, which then leads us to this problem. Do we do data localization? Well, maybe that's not the right thing to do, but maybe we do something else. And by the way, this will definitely, in my view, lead to fragmentation. We already have it. How many people here know what's happening in China? Does everybody know what's happening in China, the Great Firewall and all of that? China is fragmented already. There's a model. The only question is, who's going to be next? Iran? Russia? Take your pick. It's going to happen because this situation is uh, unsustainable, uh, in my opinion. Now, you asked me about what do I think about the U.S. I renounced my U.S. citizenship some years ago, not because of surveillance, but if I hadn't renounced it earlier, I would have renounced it because of surveillance. It's, to me, shocking and extremely disappointing that in the United States, the entire debate is restricted to whether or not we should better protect the U.S. persons and restrict the spying uh, ability of the NSA with respect to U.S. persons. And there is absolutely no discussion of non-U.S. persons. So I do not exist. I have no rights. And I don't think that is correct, sir. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think we, uh, when we touch upon fragmentation, we probably should be aware of different levels of how that can happen, that it can go towards the government or national fragmentation. It can also be kind of based on corporations. And there are also two levels. One might be the one of localized uh, flow of the traffic. The one might be uh, related to the critical uh, resources of internet, like the domain names. Uh, but you raised the hand when we mentioned the uh, fragmentation. So from the icon point, or your personal point of view. Right, so um, uh, actually just last week I was in uh, Beijing. Uh, and I met with a number of folks, uh, particularly within um, the commercial world and the academic world within China. And uh, there is currently within China from you know, an outsider, very definitely an outsider's perspective, it appears that there is a, a, a bit of a battle going on between the commercial entities, um, uh, many of which have, uh, at this point, more money than God, um, and the academic world, who are primarily interested in um, showing the world that China has the technical acumen to uh, work with the internet community and the globe uh, as a whole. And uh, a more conservative, uh, almost exclusively uh, governmental uh, side that is trying to ensure that the, um, shall we say, the scary bits of the internet do not intrude upon uh, the, the calm uh, peacefulness of the, the Chinese people. Um, the, at this stage, it's unclear to me who is going to win this battle. Uh, one of the arguments uh, that my colleagues and friends in China have been making to me with regards to the uh, transition of Diana stewardship is that it is absolutely critical for um, uh, their side uh, to see that there is forward motion to remove um, the U.S. government's uh, unique role, even if they understand that that role is largely symbolic, um, that operationally the role of the U.S. government in at least what ICANN does is um, uh, largely superficial. Um, the implication of the uh, governmental side winning is a uh, increase in fragmentation, um, a uh, uh, partitioning of the Chinese internet uh, to a greater extent than occurs now. Um, uh, but uh, the commercial side of folks within China um, have made the argument that that is um, strangling the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, the value that uh, the IPOs of Baidu and, and Tencent uh, have been driven have been largely because uh, investors see a tremendous opportunity for growth, not just within mainland China, but also throughout the world for those uh, companies. So the commercial folks are arguing very strenuously that um, fragmentation must be avoided at all costs. Um, this applies uh, in pretty much any uh, uh, country that has um, some form of free market. Um, the, in my experience in uh, traveling a bit, I've noticed that the countries that have the more robust markets um, tend to vastly favor 
um, a reduction as great as possible in the limitations on content flows that occur across the internet. Um, so uh, again, this is another area in which I see um, regulation, uh, particularly a top-down regulation that's imposed uh, through multilateral organizations, as not necessarily being a, a, a positive influence, uh, because invariably these multilateral agreements tend to focus on sort of the least common denominator, that which can get through uh, the, the various multilateral processes. Um, and as a result, ha are often uh, subject to wild interpretations, uh, whatever the government deems is in their best interest. So uh, personally, I believe that a, uh, a more laissez-faire type approach, a mechanism that allows uh, commercial entities uh, the ability to innovate as necessary um, uh, will likely have a more positive effect in encouraging even countries like China uh, to loosen the, the, the bindings that are uh, holding back uh, the various companies uh, within their economy from um, you know, gaining even greater market share. Richard, even, even if you didn't raise a hand, I would yeah. give it back to you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually think uh, every, most everything David said corresponds to my understanding. I think uh, it's very accurate summary. I just want to challenge you on, on one point. The characterization of the uh, treaty system as being uh, uh, top-down and not participative, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I'm sure everybody here knows that uh, treaties are developed by executive branches, but uh, except for the trade treaties, usually this is a fairly open process at the national level and you can comment nationally on the treaties. I, I single out the TIPP and TPP. Everybody's heard of those? The Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Treaty on Investment. Uh, I forget what TIPP stands for. That's Europe and the US. Those are being conducted in secret. I think that's shocking. It's completely unacceptable for democracies to be doing that. I'm not the only one who thinks that. But anyway, normal treaties, no, they're, they're fairly open. The ITU is not as open as it should be, I grant you that, but it's, it's still reasonably accessible. Any person, including me or David, can join their national delegation, in my case, the Swiss delegation, and get access to the, to the documents. But more importantly, the treaties are ratified by parliaments. And parliaments, at least in democratic countries, are the representatives of the people. So in the end, uh, treaties are very much subject to democratic control. And in fact, we have the great example of ACTA, Everybody remember ACTA, the trademark thing? That was scuttled by the European Parliament and probably would have also failed in the US Parliament uh, at the end. So I don't agree that somehow these treaties, you know, there are five people in a smoky room to come up with something and shove it down everybody's throat. That's not a correct characterization of the international treaty making process. And I'll quote Lessing, code is law. Now, to some extent, some of the things that are developed either technologically in the standardization body, IETF or even ITU, to the extent that it does certain standards, or let's take the contractual framework of ICANN. Uh, everybody know what is the UDRP? Uniform Dispute Resolution Process? No. Okay, so suppose uh, I'm not Nestle, and I go off, and everybody knows Nestle, right? And I go off, uh, or let's take Microsoft since they were here. Suppose I'm not Microsoft, and I go at and register the domain name microsoftsucks.com, or microsoft2.com. I can do that. It probably is only gonna cost me $6. And then the question is, well, wait a minute, am I allowed to do that or not? Am I violating their trademark rights? Well, ICANN has a special procedure to do that called the UDRP, which I think is actually a great procedure. I'm one of the arbitrators there. Maybe I'm a little bit biased. But on the whole, everybody thinks this is working well. But that was imposed through contractual mechanisms by ICANN. It was a semi-bottom-up process. I was actually participating in that process. There were a fair amount of consultations. They took place in WIPO. Uh, largely, and then they were enacted uh, through basically fiat of the uh, US government, uh, which I think in that case was a reasonable thing to do. Uh, but the point is it actually didn't go through democratic control processes because it wasn't a WIPO treaty. It was an informal consultation in WIPO, and then the US kind of said, okay, I can, when you're created, that was one of the reasons I can was created, by the way, when you're created, you're gonna do this. And so I can went off and did it. So which is the more bottom-up participative democratic democratic process. I mean, you can tell what I think. We can disagree and still be friends. Good. Uh, yeah, Isabel. Yeah, but um, I would challenge that a little bit. When, when you're talking about negotiating a treaty, which then has to be ratified in most cases by domestic parliaments, um, of course we have the representatives of the people, the national representatives in the room that will discuss this. 
But whether they have the technical capacity to understand and whether there are actually diplomats that have the technical capacity to understand uh, what exactly they are ratifying is a different question. And this is why I think, um, especially when we're talking about regulation of internet issues or cyberspace more generally, we cannot only talk about governments and maybe democratic processes because they have to involve at least the, the stakeholders that do design the technical frameworks we are using because those technical frameworks will constrain us in our actions. And as you, as you just said also, you know, Quotas Law, um, we, will be, uh, we, we will act within these uh, frameworks that will, that will be de designed. And if there's not enough technical expertise, maybe we need to find a new way to bring together uh, this technical expertise and the democratic processes, in my opinion, um, which happens successfully in some cases. Um, but not so much, I think, yet in the ITU. Maybe uh, otherwise I, I'd be interested of how they are solving the problem. <laughs> and um, because as, as far as I know, they are more uh, consulted and um, the other stakeholders are consulted in ITU processes. Uh, well, the ITU is rather complicated. No, but you, you get at the heart of the matter. And by the way, that's a problem at the national level too. Uh, I'm yeah. sure you all saw in the news that the French legislator just had the seemingly brilliant idea of putting in an extremely draconian surveillance law. It looks like what's in the, the Patriot Act is child play compared mm -hmm. to what they did in France. And they were even open about it. There's a piece of the law that says, and by the way, we're not just doing this to protect against terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. We're also doing it for economic purposes. So at least they're honest about it. They give themselves the right to spy on competitors to Airbus. Wow, the democratic state. So we have that problem, and it's probably not implementable, et cetera, et cetera, at national level. Again, remember what, what Churchill said. Democracy is a terrible system, except that it's better than any available, or it's the least worst system, I think, is the exact quote uh, from Churchill. So the problem is, yes, we do have limitations and issues with democracy. That doesn't mean we should ignore it. Second point, uh, yes, we need to consult everybody. This is not contested. Uh, so the idea of having multi-stakeholder consultations is not contested. Where there are difficulties and uh, diverging views is, how do you make decisions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so some people say, uh, well, okay, decisions are made by the multi-stakeholder community, and some people even go so far as to say with all actors having equal decision-making power. Okay, my group is saying, well, we don't like that because that gives effective veto power to private companies. Who here knows about net neutrality? Anybody know about net neutrality? Okay, net neutrality is the idea that the people who own the infrastructure, the cables, should not be able to make uh, special deals and l allow some content provider like Netflix uh, to transmit stuff faster than other competitors to Netflix. Uh, and this is a very hot debate. And in my opinion, there the US system worked very well. They did a very wide consultation. They had something like, what was it, David? 1.8 or 2 million private comments from individuals. But at the end of the day, the decision was made by the regulator. They didn't ask AT&T if AT&T would agree because AT&T had clearly said, no, we don't want this. And so in the end, the regulator made the decision on the basis of what they think is the law. That's going to be challenged in court, and the judges will say whether the FCC had exceeded its authority or not, and if the Congress doesn't like that, they can change the law. Now, the problem is we don't have that mechanism at the international level. Okay, but that's not a reason why we shouldn't try to have it at the international level. Now, the history of ITU is very interesting in this respect. The ITU, when it was first created in 1865, was just governments, mostly European governments at the time. And th two years later or three years later, they realized this doesn't work because of exactly what you said. We don't have the technical expertise to make the right decisions. And so the ITU was enlarged in, I think, 1867, if my memory is correct, to include what they call sector members, which is basically anybody these days, as long as you're willing to pay. Uh, who are there in a consultative role. So the consultation takes place, but then the decisions are made by the governments. And I realize that not our governments are democratic, so there's a breakdown yes. there. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to improve that system and use it. We have, a, most people don't know it, there's a thing called the Interparliamentary Union, which is another intergovernmental organization which tries to group many parliaments. There are not that many countries that are present, but still a fair amount of present. You know, why not take that as an embryo to try to develop then something where you actually have legislators getting involved like we did in Europe. There's the national parliaments, there's the European parliament, and there's the executive, which is the European Commission. 
So we do have models that could lead us to a more democratic world system, uh, and we could progress that way. And I don't think the solution is to say, well, that system has this defect and that defect, therefore let's throw it out, and by the way, let's let Google rule the world, because that's where we're going. Nobody's mentioned Google yet, so I will. Where we're going is that Google is going to own you. you. You saw they're going to give you little toys for your children, right? Oh, that's great. And it's all going to be connected and monitored, and they're going to sell the data to various people to make money. Is so, that the world you want? So if I, if I, can, uh, if I can just try to, to get some points out of this, which I don't like, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that we don't trust the states. Because they do surveillance. They sometimes break the human rights. We don't trust the corporate sector because of their power when it comes to net neutrality debates, because of uh, privacy issues, data collection and stuff. Uh, so there is not much trust that's left there. And uh, the question is basically, Isabel, you opened it. Uh, on one hand, David said uh, that the legal system probably is not enough. You gave some examples that it can work, but you said it cannot be enough because it's hard sometimes to do the enforcement and as Isabel said, there is a lack of capacity for bringing the laws in, a, in the right way currently. Uh, but then there is no system for multi-stakeholders to, to decide to bring decisions, and there's a question if there should be one. So you basically open up the question, so finding the new way. What's the new way? Um, I leave it to, to the floor. We have one comment there, right? One there. And then there and there. Great. <laughs> we'll pick a couple of comments, and then we throw it back. We have about eight more minutes, so... Introduce yourself, please. Uh, Eric uh, I'm a programmer in uh, CCD COE. Uh, speaking of the inter future of internet, everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. And uh, we already have decentralized uh, domain name system, de decentralized virtual currencies, and uh, we are going to have uh, distributed autonomous anonymous organizations. Um, Yet uh, we have not uh, discussed much about these possibilities. Uh, for example, decentralized uh, anonymous organizations don't care about politics or legal issues at all, but they can exist very well. Uh, we n <coughs> these um, things can appear from uh, I2P uh, network and Tor network. Mm -hmm. They're based, uh, if you know anything about Bitcoin, it's the same peer-to-peer -peer techno technology distributed uh, decentralized marketplaces are also in the making. They all solve the problems that uh, currently are in, uh, in the legal uh, space uh, because they await it. They await these problems. You can't uh, force anything there. So what's your comment on that? Thanks. Uh, let's take a couple more questions uh, yeah. Hello. or comments. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Henry Regas from the CCDCOE, and I have a question mainly to Mr. Conrad. Uh, since the title of the panel is The Future of Internet Governance, and we know that the US government announced that it will end its uh, contract with ICANN, and it's supposed to end in uh, September, right? It's supposed to end. No. So do you have, any, as you said, the transition is insanely complex? or what was the word you used. Anyway, do, could you explain or do you have an idea what would uh, I can look after this contract? <laughs> and, and could you see that some of those uh, critics uh, currently, let's say Russia or China or countries that promote a multilateral system, do you see them, do you see it moving towards this kind of system or will it basically stay the same? Uh. See if we have, uh, before <laughs> right. that, we have another yep. question, or should we move it to, there is one more, and then we'll get back to okay. two of you. Uh, so Chris Inglis, teaching at the Naval Academy, um, two-part question. Um, so first for Richard, you kind of talked about the French recently um, attempting to pass a surveillance law um, and decried not so much the result as much as the process by which they did that. My recollection was that was done by virtue of their legislative branch, and the vote was 438 to 86. So my first question would be, what is the preferred process for a nation to make a choice of that sort? And second, I'd like to go to the corner that Vladimir um, opened up, or Richard as well, which is, is this um, a governance scheme that must be extensible to the private sector? Because while the government has unique powers that it can pose based upon the information it holds, um, it's a piker compared to the private sector in terms of what it knows about citizens. 
Thank you. Uh, before moving to the panel, I don't know if I can ask Anne-Marie, can we have another hour for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the questions are very sorrowful. Should we start with, or, or I'll just throw it to you all the three questions. So you combine the way you wish, because we have about five minutes more, and try to be kind of a tweet-like, if yeah. you can. Uh, well, you can't really respond to the icon issue in the tweet. <laughs> respond to the icon issue in a tweet. Oh. Uh, Wait and see. Yes, the transition will occur, things will be different, but the same. <laughs> things will be That's a bit different. A good answer. <laughs> I hope this satisfies you. Same, same, but different. But not by September 30, because U.S. Congress passed the law saying it can't happen by September 30. <laughs> if you get a short blog. Right. Yeah, so uh, in greater detail, uh, Richard is, is right that um, the September 30 deadline, and don't tell my boss I said this, <laughs> seems unlikely. Um, I'm, uh, it's off the record. Shut them house. Yeah, even though yeah, it goes exactly, yeah. stream. Um, you can quote me. <laughs> if, if you'd asked me a month ago, um, I probably uh, would have been much more pessimistic about the, uh, the probability of completion of the transition. Um, I've recently, uh, given things that have been happening recently, particularly within Capitol Hill and within the U.S. government, my impression, uh, I'm much more optimistic. I think, uh, it's, as I said, unlikely September 30 will happen, uh, that the transition will be implemented by September 30th, I think, uh, against the laws of physics at this stage. Um, however, uh, my suspicion is that before the end of the year, there will be a proposal submitted to the U.S. government and then there will be some uh, amount of time necessary to implement the structures, as I said in my uh, sort of joking response, um, they are gonna be different. Um, yeah, actually, Richard can probably go into excruciating detail since he's read all of the documents. It's quite impressive. Um, uh, but you know, the, the, the models uh, are being augmented to improve ICANN's accountability to the community. Um, there's going to be the creation of something called the post-transition IANA, uh, that will basically separate the uh, entity within ICANN, the department in ICANN that performs the IANA functions into sort of a, uh, an affiliate organization, wholly owned affiliate by, uh, owned by ICANN. Um, but these are basically just sort of rearranging deck chairs in some sense. Um, structurally, um, the, the system will still be um, private sector led, uh, multi-stakeholder in focus. Um, whether or not uh, uh, countries who have preferences towards um, multilateral controls will see this as a positive or negative. I don't believe that there will be a significant change in their opinions. Um, you know, I might be wrong. Yeah, uh, I'll, Richard, I'll, direct response to yes. this and to the other and question. To the other three, yeah. Tweet. Very quick. Yeah, so I, I'll agree with that and I'll say that it seems fairly clear to me that the jurisdiction will remain in the U.S. and that will trigger um, some lack of trust from the people who don't like that. Whether they're right or not is a different question. So to the first point, everything that could be decentralized will be, unfortunately not. Why is Facebook centralized? There's no reason for that. It makes no sense. It's a complete aberration until you think of economics. So I'll just say three words, economies of scale and network effects. And that's why actually everything that can be centralized is. The internet today is frighteningly centralized, not at the infrastructure level, but at the application level. How many alternatives are to music, to I, uh, what's it called? I don't use it, I, iTunes, right? One, two. What, what's number two after Twitter outside of China? In China, there's number one, but there's no number two. There isn't any. So I agree, it should be decentralized. That's one of the things we're pushing for. And we need frameworks which encourage uh, decentralization. Um, the French law, yeah, the parliament got it wrong. I mean, democracies make mistakes. I can point to stupid things that the uh, Swiss did also, even though they have popular vote. Still, it's the least worst system, and hopefully the French will correct their aberration in uh, due course. And yes, the more important thing is to rein in uh, the private companies. Uh, you know, we all accept safety standards for airlines, for cars, for pharmaceuticals. Let's take pharmaceuticals. It wasn't always that way. Who's heard of snake oil as a term of art? Okay, snake oil was unregulated medicine that was freely sold in many countries, in particular the U.S., until sometime in the mid-19th century. Because you could go around and say, this wonderful thing will cure everything and get money. Well, we can't do that anymore. Why can't we do that anymore? So it all has to do with economics because we recognize that consumers cannot have adequate information to do this. So do we want regulation that stifles innovation? No. We actually want regulation that encourages innovation. So we want regulation that prevents Google from being 
the monopolist of information, search engines, et cetera, et cetera, advertising, and so on and so forth, and we're not getting it yet. That's a whole other two-hour discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh, this, this watch is irritating. Uh, Isabel, your last tweet with regards to decentralization, <laughs> especially if you want the others, but this one. Well, I, I would just like to answer on the decentralization question again. Um, I think decentralization is uh, really the way to go for many technologies because it is it builds on the distributed structures of the internet, and it's exactly not, it's exactly opposed to the fragmentation of the internet into centralized nodes, basically. So, um, yeah, I very much appreciate uh, those technologies. I think that we should also, um, and this is maybe something to think about um, later, uh, we should also have a thought about um, IPv6 addresses and, and the uh, scarcity of IP addresses, because um, looking at decentralization of the web and so many new devices coming online, um, we don't have enough IP addresses to connect them all to the internet, and especially not in developing countries that are actually running out of IP addresses, which poses multiple problems. And if we adopted more of them, if we adopted um, them at a large scale, we'd be actually uh, able to communicate directly with each other, whereas now there are so many intermediaries and points of centralized control that will always bundle the information that um, I think this is a crucial point when we're talking about decentralization uh, of structures as well. Thank you, Isabel. I hope you're confused because <laughs> that was the point of the session, just to try to open up all the questions and get the picture, the much, much bigger, broader picture of complex issues which are very related to cybersecurity. I thank you all for your patience and your questions and comments, and I thank to the panelists and Amri for hosting it. Um, should I ask for an applause or you will? You will. I, final words. Uh, just really congratulations to the panel. So many interesting ideas. At least I've got four ideas for next cycle and for se different sessions. Uh, so very well done. And also on behalf of um, our conference, here is uh, the conference gift. Since we tackled a lot the issue of surveillance, I think this really, <laughs> this is really fitting. So thank you again, and great applause to the panelists, to the moderator, and to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.